What's going on, Badger fans? Welcome to Lockdown Badgers. We got Justin, Rajiv, myself. Uh, we got a bunch of good questions, uh, football and basketball. This is all just a community show. We're going to break down those questions that you either sent on Twitter or on a YouTube comment, get into all the great guard, Luke Fickle, the football team. What could go wrong? Let's go. The answer probably a lot. <laughs> you are Locked On Badgers, your daily podcast on the Wisconsin Badgers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on, Badger fans? Welcome to Lockdown Badgers, your team every single day. Thank you so much for making us part of your daily lives or this community. It's really awesome, and we really, really do appreciate it. Today's episode brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers join today, and you'll get $150 in bonus bets. If your first bet of $5 or more wins, visit FanDuel.com slash Lockdown to get started. And as promised, we jump right into it. Um, this first question we got, ignore injuries or quarterback play, because that could derail any football season. Rajiv, we'll start with you on this one. What's the biggest reason this team doesn't hit that six and a half over? If you take yeah, first of that, that, that over is just so low, which I'm okay with <clears throat> because we can make money off it. Um, for me, it's going to be run defense. This is something that I think we struggled with a lot this year and whether or not the D line play is going to be up to snuff. We were just talking about that a little off camera. I think that, if if the if the run defense looks like it did last year and we can get bowled over by several different teams and teams that have good edge rushers can attack there because look the schedule is a lot harder so we know that we know that we're gonna have to go to usc we're gonna have to play penn state we got rough stretches throughout the year um and i think that's going to be the thing outside of of course qb play that will dictate how well we do and, and our ability to stop the run because historically that's where we've excelled and last year we had a little bit of a, a hiccup in that area so that's that's where i'm focusing on yeah, I think, oh man, this is a tough question because honestly, I think it comes down to offense again with this team. I think the defense will be better. What it, How mm -hmm. it translates in terms of statistics is hard for me to say, but I think that there's, there's just going to be more athletic. Um, it may not change the points per game that they give up a whole lot, but it probably will help us situationally a lot more than what we had this last year where we struggled to shut off some third and longs. I think offensively is where I look at it. And if this team does not click offensively more than they have, then we're going to struggle to be better because we, the points, we can't be averaging 23 or whatever points per game we were this last year. That's just not going to cut it against the schedule. Yeah. I'm going to take, uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. I'm just going to add one more point to my thing <clears throat> because like part of the reason I say that is in close games, if you can't shut down the run at the end in the fourth quarter, that's really when teams like, USC's and Penn State's and the Iowa's and the Ohio State's can really salt games away. And that's that's where I feel like when you come down, comes down to win-loss totals, if we have a better run defense and more stout up front and we can stuff runs, it helps us win those games. Yeah, I'm going to take Rajiv's point and, and get even more micro. I think it's all to the defense line. I think our linebackers will be better. That'll help against the run game. We are we talked a lot on this show, guys. We're relying on hopefully Ernest Willer can play a few snaps. and Hopefully Dylan Johnson can. Hopefully Jamel Howard's ready. Those are all freshmen or redshirt freshmen, right? Like that's the position we are in on the defensive line. That's not a great spot to be in. No, thank you, Captain Obvious. Um, we're hoping Elijah Hills comes in and plays a, a, a pretty big role. Like you, I saw you guys' depth chart show. You guys have him starting. This is a guy, if we're going to just play devil's advocate, he had a, a sack and a half at Albany last year, mm -hmm. right? Like I'm not saying he can't be good, and I'm glad he's here. Uh, but to me, the defense line is a massive, massive question mark, which I think in two years could be a lot better. But I'm, I don't know this year. I think it's a massive question mark. So let me pose a question back to you on that. Do you think that the defensive line is worse or better than last year? I th We talked a little bit before the show on this. I think it's incrementally better probably, but that's so dependent on a trio of, of freshmen or retro freshmen that we haven't seen play. Like they have to, they have to get something out of those three sure. guys. So my, I guess the way the pushback I would have on that question then is if that's the case, then wouldn't we anticipate that last year's is at least the baseline of what we're looking at for in terms of play? And I think we can get by on that. I don't think we can get by having last year's offense again. Like that's a problem this year. If if we're that bad offensively again, most of the teams that we played, some of them are pretty bad offensively. Mm -hmm. We're not going to have that luxury quite as much this year. I yeah, mean, if we no. can just catch the ball, we'll be a lot better oh. off offensively. Yeah, <laughs> All right, let's get to the next one here. Um, I want to quickly go with this one, Justin. We'll start with you. This is from Christian Gross. Does this team need to go in for next year to keep the recruiting momentum? This is a really good question because Fickle is coming and recruited really well. Do you now need to start winning games to keep that going? 
I mean, to an extent, yes, but you also need to like the bigger part of this is you need to look like the system is fun and that you're showing progress. So if we come out and we average, say, 28 points per game and maybe the record doesn't improve, but the offense looks like, hey, I can see myself in that. I, I, I think I can give them an upgrade over what they have. And it looks like a system that high level or quality players want to play in. That'll help defensively. The defensive line, I, I don't know what you can do there to prove to these guys other than having like Willer or Jamel Howard or Johnson show and flash instantly as, as freshmen here to be able to say, Hey, that's, that's a defense that looks like it's fun to play in. And I think we also would agree. I don't know how much three, three, five we're going to play. Like if we go back to playing the same two, four, five again, what, what can you really take away from the defensive line? You're not going to show much. And then it starts to lean on those outside linebackers more, but I think looking at it from that perspective, those are the two spots that I look at are your, are your skill position weapons and your guys that are at the defensive line. And we need to show something, some flash there or opportunity or prove that guys are getting there. But a lot of it will come down to just how good a recruiters, the coaches are in general. We see teams with bad records every year end up in the top 25. And it's like, this is what happens when you have good recruiters. They can sell. Yeah, I think this is a good question, and it's kind of difficult because in general, I would say, yes, you do need to go in for it. You need to show improvement. But given the schedule that we have and how every, everyone's aware of the Big Ten schedule and obviously the new Big Ten and everyone they're bringing into the conference, 8-4 and four would be a pretty good record with our schedule next year. So I'm going to say, no, we don't have to go 7. We don't have to necessarily go 8-4. and four. If we go 7-5, and five, I don't think the recruiting goes down because of what Justin is saying. Ultimately, we've got to believe that Fickle knows how to sell and and you've seen them doing it since Cincinnati is not a place where you can really sell a lot of things and look what he did there. So, you know, obviously Hitchler's gone. That was one of the top recruit guys, but I feel like he's creating a culture um, that is inviting to younger players that, that does kind of step things into the new NIL world and everything that's happening. So I don't think we need to go eight and four necessarily because of given how strong the schedule is and how different you know, the big 10 is going to look as a whole. Yeah. I, those are both really good points. Justin's point about salesmen sell, right? Like they'll, they'll find something to sell. Oh, we went seven and five. That means you could come in and play right away, right? Like good recruiters recruit. Um, and Rajiv, to your point, the schedule, everybody knows it. I do think that talking to recruits last year, the the selling point was the future. Like mm-hmm. Luke Fickle's going to get this thing going. That does get harder to sell the longer you struggle. So I don't think next year needs to be a jumping off yeah. point, but I don't think in two years you can still be going seven and five. I would agree with that. Yeah. 2025, they need to start showing real yeah. signs that they can compete with anybody. Mm-hmm. And you might be able to lose a few games, but they need to be close. You can't yep. be going into Bama and losing by, fifth, you know, two touchdowns. You it's just the eye test, game. right? Like, you'll it know is. when we're playing Ohio State and Michigan, if we're if we're competing in those games and if, if they're just blowouts, then, yeah, that's that's going to fail that eye test. But as long look, as we're competing, we'll be full. Look at Lane Kiffin down at Ole Miss. He would go like eight and four, but they were flashy on offense, and eventually he started getting guys in there to come play for him because – Oh man, they're dropping 40 bombs on people and he, you know, it's flashing and looks fun to play in. Guys start to go to that. It's the same thing with Oregon on the West Coast. You're flashy, you're scoring a ton of points on offense, you have jerseys and stuff that kids like. Kids want to go play in that because it's like, oh, we're going to dominate. So, you start it starts to eventually pay off. Now they have a lot of money behind them too, but it sells. If it's sexy, it sells. Wisconsin having the old school, you know, Hey, you're going to come here and we're going to win by a touchdown and you're going to, we're going to run for 300 yards and pass the ball for 120. That's not something that recruits are like, Oh man, that sounds so fun. Unless you're a running back. And even they didn't want to play. No. It. If, it, if it's sexy, it sells. That is a locked on's motto. That's why locked on badgers have done so well. Uh, we're going to take one quick break here. We're going to come back. Uh, this question I want to throw up here before the break. This is from uh, Ryan H. Uh, it, the danger of placing guard and becoming Nebraska ish. Would you guys, is it possible Nebraska that... Nebraska was never Wisconsin, is what I would oh, say. No, well, on the football side. But my, my point is, I guess the question here is, is there a risk that you bring in someone who craters the program potentially and sends it into some type of spiral? We're going to get to that after the break. But first, a quick break for our friends of the show over at FanDuel. FanDuel remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs, all your sports betting information. Obviously, the NFL season is wrapped up, but baseball is about spring trainings here. Um, great time to start thinking about your baseball action, futures, college basketball. We're going to talk a lot about the the Badgers on this team and potentially whether or not you want to put some um, futures action on there. FanDuel is the perfect place, place to do it. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Get all your sports betting action, every sport you can think of, futures, teasers, parlays, spreads. It's all over there on FanDuel+. Plus. It's incredibly simple, easy, fast, easy to get payouts. 
Uh, that's why we go over to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. That is the official sports betting partner of the NFL, the NBA, and the LockedOn Network because it is simple, easy, fast. FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. All right, let's let's get going here on this one. I, I want to put that question back up. And I'll, Rajiv, I'll just kick it to you to start this one. Um, there is a danger because there, there's, there's a chance, right, um, you bring somebody in and he's not as good as guard. Um, I would actually say there's probably a better chance you bring somebody in who's not as good as guard than you bring somebody in who elevates the program. Is it worth taking that risk if you're consistently getting decent seasons? Yeah, this is a great discussion. And I think it's all it comes down to how you feel as a fan and how what you like. And for me, I am a bit more of a high floor guy in basketball because any team that gets in the tournament can technically win it, right? And so a team that consistently can challenge for Big Ten titles, consistently get into the tournament – versus having a guy that yeah maybe has final four upside but also has missing the tournament downside and the floor is lower i don't want that you know the, it, it's not and to be fair i don't really want it in football either but the reason that i think i was so big on fickle is fickle is like a whole different world right like that he's done it elsewhere he's shown that he has such a high ceiling and he can elevate a program with guard which it's it's a discussion so many people have all the time is it really good enough that he's not you know quite getting quite as many wins as Bo was but had, we make we make we make the tournament and yes we missed the tournament last year that's fair and that's not it cannot happen he's missed it twice now. i do think that that high floor is really important in basketball because of the way the tournament's structured and because ultimately you hit on a couple big recruits you got a good team you got a johnny davis type of a guy anything can happen in the tournament so uh, i'm just gonna come in with this and say this if store leaves there's a very solid chance that they don't make the tournament next year like that's a huge hole that they'd have to fill. And you're expecting free tag to come in and potentially fill that. We don't know if winter will take a substantial step forward. We don't know what Gus is going to be. I think black will be, will be better, but I don't know if he's going to be a guy who's ready to take on scoring 13, 14 points a game in order to help out the scoring. I look at this and I say that he, he kind of is that. And I, I think you may get somebody who's more volatile, but you may get somebody that's substantially better at talent acquisition. And I'll, I'll always take the risk on having a guy who can bring in talent over a guy who is going to try to win with a system. Because if you have a system, there is it can be gotten. We've seen that with what Wisconsin had for football. If you don't have the talent there, a good athletic, talented team is going to exploit the fact that you're limited. They're capable of just burning you. Whereas if you have talent and you're a decent coach, you have a better chance of getting that to go down. I'm not saying that the guy who comes in might not be a, as good of a coach. It's possible that he's a downgrade X's and O's guy, but he may be able to bring in better on the floor talent, which probably mitigates some of the difference. And those, then you have players that can make plays that you don't have right now. Well, to your point with Store, though, if Store leaves, I mean, Greg Guard's the guy that brought Store in. Like, so you well, have yeah. to at least give him credit for. I, right. I do, but I, I can also look at it and say that's one out of seven years that he's done it. So he's got to he's he's prove it. Over seven years. But I, I think my the, the concern I would have, and I listen, I, I hear you. Like, I think there's you could certainly bring in people who sell Wisconsin better, recruit better than Greg Garden. I, I don't even think that's. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I think we would agree. Wisconsin should be capable of recruiting towards the top of the Big Ten. In terms but that of doesn't basketball. necessarily translate to more wins. Like you could very easily, like Nebraska, they were in the situation with Solich, right? Where they had a good program. They won six, like they won a lot of games. Like Greg Gard has statistically won a lot of games. And they said, we're going to trade that consistency and that high floor to take a swing for a title. If you could time travel a Nebraska fan back to that moment, they would say, screw a freaking title. I just want good quality sports. And that is the danger when you start replacing a coach who does Statistically, you're, you're going to have a hard time finding a coach who comes in and wins at a higher clip than Greg Gard. Um, you're, you're probably going to find a guy who's not as successful. I'm just, I don't, I guess my bigger point is, I don't think there's a ton of coaches out there you bring in and you're like, I know this guy can win a title at Wisconsin for sure. I, I think we need, we're getting to the point where we need to start taking a look at his track record after post, post Bo Ryan recruits and start saying, this is the last, this is five years of what he did and look at it, what his track record was during that time frame. Because that's who he is. Like this is, we're, we don't have to judge him based off of those first couple of seasons where he had Nigel and he had Bronson. You could start to look at it and be like, "All right, well, he's got his own track record now. This is what he's done with his guys," and look at it and say, "Do we feel that's good enough?" I think that you can kind of look at it and say he had a couple of years where he won Big Ten titles, 
but you'd also start to look at there's some troubling things with him where his teams tend to fade and they don't get stronger as the season goes on. That was something different than Bo Ryan. Bo Ryan, that was the opposite. His teams may be a little fluctuate a little early in the season, but typically they got hotter towards the end of the season and were really screaming when they got to the Big Ten tournament. So you'd have teams, even if the talent level wasn't extremely good, they were playing at such a high clip and together that they would play well come tournament. And then, then obviously March is a crapshoot, but even there, he tended to be better than most. I mean, he's had three seasons. <clears throat> we had 14 and six, 14 and six, 15 and five, three seasons that he's had his players that he's had basically records that Bo Ryan had in the, in the, in the big 10 conference. I think that I, I still, I mean, like that Frank Solch thing that you talked about, uh, Ryan, like it's a, it's a fair point because you want, I want to be able to cheer for my team every year in the tournament and hope that something good can happen. Yeah. I'm going to get frustrated if he loses in the first round every year, that's obviously not acceptable either, but to, to, to have the team that's in the bottom, that's in the basement now, of the big 10. And it looks like, look at Michigan and Ohio state this year. I mean, how awful would it be to have that team? We never have that team. We're never going to have that team with Greg guard. And I feel like there, there is something to that. Yeah. Now I definitely think that I want, I know Greg guard needs to change. We've talked to nauseam about it. There clearly things need to improve, but I do want that chance to chase a title every year. And I don't think it's, I don't think you can say right now that Greg guard cannot deliver that. I 100% think that I can say that he can't do that. I don't think he, he, can he, he can't, he can't no. be in the tournament there every year to fight for championships. No, it, I, do not, I don't think he's got a prayer in hell of making it to a NCAA championship game. No, no, he I'm saying not. compete for big 10 championships and make the tournament every year. Oh. He can do that. I mean, two of the last five years, he hasn't made it or what is it? 2018 and, and last year. And this year it could be, there is an opportunity where this goes south. If he, oh, if we're not, it, we're not. That's not going to happen. I don't disagree with you. They're probably going to make it in, but they are not playing good basketball. There's a chance that we go. Well, how many games do we have left? Like six, six. We have five, five, five games left. Five games left. All right. If we go one and four, suddenly we're eighteen and eighteen and what is that? Would we be? We'd be ten and ten in conference with eleven quad one wins. We'd still make the tournament. Yeah. You we would it. probably still make it, but we would be in a really ugly duckling going into the tournament. That's, that's a nine seed right there. I would, say, I would say though there's there's other bad teams on the schedule too. I'm not even saying we're a bad team. Like we're there's other teams that we're this version beat. of what we've been lately is a bad team. I know we it's not you can say earlier in the season we weren't. Like I we're not know, playing the quality of basketball. We're not nearly as good as we should be right now, but you yeah. have a couple road losses. You lost to Purdue and you lost a game in overtime. Like it's I just don't think it's as bad as people are thinking it is. But maybe I'm on an island there, and that's completely fair. Um, I, again, like you lose a couple big 10 road games. One of them is in overtime. You lose at Nebraska. They have a crazy rally. That's a tough place to play. You lose to Purdue. Like you shouldn't lose it by 22 to Rutgers. A hundred percent agree. But like the, the, the stretch isn't as ca catastrophic as I think. I, I just, I don't look at it that same way. Cause you also have a stretch earlier in the year where you're blitzing people. That team is still this team. These, the, the truth of this team is somewhere in the middle is my point. I, there's something wrong with this team from a chemistry standpoint or from an, like a, just an effort standpoint where whatever we were doing earlier in the season, it just isn't there anymore. Like you'd think that guys could turn – like intensity is something you can turn on to a point. Focus and being ready to play and everything else, your effort level, if you're not able to get yourself up like that, there's a problem. And that seems to be gone for the most part. Even like we talked about it, like everyone looked better in this last game offensively against Iowa, but defensively, for whatever reason, the intensity just isn't there with these guys to just play their butts off on that end. Other than Chucky, Chucky's the one person I look at that I'm like, man, we get four or five defensive plays from him that are just gems every game. And we're not seeing that from anybody else. And Krell is just brutal to me watching him in the post. He is, he is so bad defensively in the post from the standpoint of he just doesn't affect guys the way you'd like him to affect for that the, the size he is. Well, let me put a pin in this question because I want to get into some more, but just wrapping it up, it doesn't sound like Justin, you're that concerned with potentially hiring someone that could – it looks like – it sounds like you're – I think if you get stupid and you do a flash hire like what Michigan did, yeah, you're going to have a problem. If you find somebody that – I think you're better off finding a guy who's maybe toiled in kind of like a Bo Ryan where he's been ultra successful at a lower level and is a guy who believes in what he's got that has some charisma, you have an opportunity to find it. The problem is, is when you get to Division One basketball, they don't want to take chances on those guys. They want somebody that's more proven, even if they're not as good. 
Rajiv, it sounds like you're a little more on the fence on this one. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely just of the I want the higher floor thing. So I am I am very concerned about that. I, I will be concerned if we get rid of Greg Gard and we replace him. I will be concerned that we're going to be a team that look, look at Ohio State and Michigan this year. That's all I got to say. Those two teams are teams that do not tolerate being poor in any sport, and they are in the bottom of the Big Ten. That cannot happen at Wisconsin, and I don't want that. Yeah, I would just put my last pin on this. And fans always think the grass is greener. Like, and I think it. I think that worked out in football. By the way, a lot of people kind of want to move on with Paul Chris. You ended up with Luke Fickle. I think that was great. That's incredible. That doesn't mean a similar is going to happen in basketball. Right. Like, you just. Success can leave very and quickly. From the other years. side of it is people just get apathetic and you start to look at it and your fan base starts to check out because they're like, it is what it is. We're we're middle of the road, big time team, and we're just going to sit here. It's like being the eighth seed or just outside the playoffs in the NBA. You're sitting there and you're kind of like, why do I want to root for this team? Like the ceiling that they have is they make it to the playoffs and get swept in the first round. Like you start to look at it and I've dealt with it with Brewers baseball for forever in my life where you look at it and you're like, we don't want to put money in that. So we're never quite good enough to be challenging for a world series, but we can constantly make the playoffs and then just get banged around by the teams that are dropping 200 million in payroll. Yeah. No, listen, it's fair. There's again, this is a very nuanced thing. I don't think there's, there's not a perfect answer here. Right. And you could hire somebody who's the next Luke Fickle, the basketball side, or you could, to Rajiv's point, become Michigan. And you think fans are apathetic with an eight seed. Watch the Colts Center if we win four Big Ten games. Oh, <laughs> like, it's going to look like Penn State. <laughs> yeah. so the, crowd, the way the crowd acts is going to be the same as it's been this season. It, it, would, be worse. it would be <laughs> zombie apocalypse in there. All right, we're going to take a quick break for our friends of the show over at LinkedIn. All of us here are professionals, Justin Rajiv, myself. LinkedIn is the number one source. I use that term loosely for me, but the other two locked on or LinkedIn is the number one source for all your hiring needs. LinkedIn.com slash locked on college screening tools, no business. You have no, no time to waste interviewing someone who has no business coming in the door. They made up their resume, whatever LinkedIn gets rid of those people, the right people in the door, the first time on time, you save time, you save money, you get the right fits for your team. Every hire for a small business is a huge deal. You got to get them right. That's why LinkedIn remains the number one source for all your hiring needs and why small businesses continue to rank LinkedIn jobs. Number one delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. Uh, right now with a great hire, uh, you can boost your job for our great offer. You can boost your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. The number one professional uh, resource for hiring managers, for people looking for jobs anywhere on the planet, LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. All right, let's get to this next question here. I think this one's really interesting too. Um, I'll start off with this one. Uh, we, we were really high on running this team back early in the year. Everybody's coming back, Justin. Everybody's coming back, Rashid, and we're going to add free tag and probably hit the portal. This team could be a Final Four team. How excited are we about that right now? Um, I would say I've said that the one thing where I've kind of changed on this is I think regardless of what Stephen Crowell does, he's coming back. I think you need to go get a five to push him. I think you need – you can't play the game next year while we have established starters – we're either going to find a role player or we're not going to do anything, which is kind of what we've been doing for a couple of years. I think you have to go get an athletic five this year, um, no matter what what else you do on the roster. I think you still need a four. You need some depth. I think they have to go find a five in the offseason this year. I completely agree with that, and I've felt that way for a long time. And the, the plus side to having an athletic guy that you bring in is you made it at least get some hustle points from him that Crowell just flat out is not getting right now. And he hopefully provides something more in interior defense. Like we're to the point where I'd almost rather have like a Greg Stizma out there where you know that he's just a defensive force that guys can't get around and he blocks shots and everything else. Scoring isn't necessarily as big of a problem with this team, but defensively interior defense is a massive problem with this. And if you can't cut off the penetration, you at least need somebody who can erase shots. We don't have either one of those things. Mm -hmm. yeah agreed <clears throat> we need a five i mean listen chris holdman just got let go at ohio state go get okpara talk about a rim protector that that we should be able yeah. to go get or something like that i mean i agree we need to go out and get some rim protection uh, for the for the most part though i am okay with this because i think free tag raises our ceiling in my opinion like he, he we have instant depth in the backcourt now that we have issues with this year obviously with mcgee coming back that will get a little better It'll be a little struggle for minutes with free tag, but I think if you find the right rotations and if guard can hopefully improve some rotations and put some small ball out there, you have a really good opportunity to have, have we have a lot of good guards on this team next year, right? And if we can add a little bit of depth up front and, or listen, I mean, winter and Yalden are still there theoretically with another season in, in, in the weight room, 
Winter could get a little better, get a little stronger. If Gus comes in, Gus is that X factor. We have no idea what we have in Gus Yaldin yet. Last year, I mean, look at the listen to this show before he, he showed up, and we talked a lot about him. So, mm-hmm. I feel like if he can be the person that we expected him to be before he got here, that you add a lot of front court depth with just that, and you add a lot of um, you know strength. Still need a good rim protector, so I agree we we could go out and get in a five in the portal. Um, but with the guys that we have on the bench and with another season, you know, putting on some weight, get Brady Collins involved. Let's make it happen. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> so, I, I'll I'll push back a little on that. Number one. Um, I think we thought – I don't want us to set too many expectations on free tag. I'm very high on him too. I would love to see him come in and average 8, 9, 10 points a game right off the bat. But I, I don't want to set that expectation on him that if that's not what we get from him that it's a failure. Um, because Winter's a prime example of this. You have a guy who's averaging upper 20s in high school and he gets here and we're, we're occasionally seeing these games where he pops off for six points or whatever. But if he's only playing, like there's a chance free take comes in and he only plays 10 minutes next year, a game at, at best. And if that's the case, it's going to be hard for him to be really productive in that time, even though he is somebody who I think we would agree we'll see flashes for sure. I think the athletic talent is there. There's little things with him that I think that he's going to have to be, in order to see the floor for substantial minutes, he's going to have to be really adept at, which is protecting the ball, not turning it over, making good passes, and he's going to have to be good defensively. So in general, I, I'm kind of along with Rajiv on this one a little bit. I, I do really like getting a, a, the core back. I think veteran teams typically do well in college basketball. And honestly, even if we only get 10 minutes, if Frite comes in and gives you 10 minutes, that's 10 minutes you're not getting from somewhere else on the bench right now. That feels like a nice piece to add into that that mix. I agree with you, though. Like, let's – like, it's tough. Or it's tough to ask too much of a freshman. But I think he's going to come in and find a role. Um I do I mean, look, look, look what Blackwell did this year. Like if free tag can, can provide Blackwell minutes like next year and, and be, I mean, all it does is it raises the floor and the ceiling. I mean, he raises oh, I, the level of the team. I, I'm not arguing that at all. I just Blackwell is an outlier for what you normally see. So I don't want to come in and be like, set that as the bar for him. That's fair. That's because fair. I think that he's very talented. And by the time he leaves here, I think that he will definitely leave a mark on the program, but I don't want him. I don't want to set this precedent that if he's, if he's not up to what Blackwell was this year, that he's a failure because I don't think that that's the case with him. I think that he's going to be a very good player, but I don't want to have the expectations that that's who he's got to be day one. Can I just ask a, a side question on this? Do you guys like, what do you think as far as minutes, just general estimate minutes and potential points per game that we could see out of Gus next year? I have no clue. Like I, I wish I, I I, honest, cause it's, it's, I wish I knew more about what's going on with him. That that, that that to me is a huge X factor in what happens with this team next well, year. It's also like, a huge red, red flag <laughs> that we yeah. have no idea what what like is he going to be on the roster even next year? I don't know. I like I don't know what's going on with his situation, and that's where I can't say anything because it's like he's Listen, clearly red shirting. We think, but yeah. unless we know what the heck's going on there, I don't want to say this is a dude that's going to come in and give us 15 minutes and be a productive player for us when will he even be playing? It's a great question, man. Cause here's the thing. If I'll say this, if, if we get locked in Gus Yaldin and the version of what we thought was coming to your point, I think he's going to play. He's going to give you back up five minutes and it's going to really be helpful because he's still all those things that we talked about and gushed about, not just us, like sports illustrated recruiting sites, like other people have played him. Like he, he was coming in with hype for a reason and he gives you a big body in the middle. What One of the things we talk about this year, we get pushed around. He can give you some of that, but he's got to be locked in off the court, right? Mm-hmm. And you just read reports like they're out there. Like for whatever reason, he wasn't – he didn't come here locked in to the mindset of a yeah, division. It, it came down to it where it seemed like he – once he got the scholarship and was locked in, then it's like, all right, smooth sailing, all the hard work is done. It's like, no, that's your starting point. Like if you if you have really high aspirations, whether it play overseas or whatever, <laughs> now you're doubling down. Like however hard you worked in high school, that's your starting point because it's everyone's going to be working a lot harder once they get into a college strength and conditioning program. You got to button it up and go. Let me bring out a couple more quick questions here. Um, this one's from Wayne Meyer. Seriously, you guys can't see that guard wants a siege and gone. He wants that scholarship for use in the portal. Uh, really quick thoughts on: Do you think guard is trying to push Connor out? I I don't think so because I. Frankly, I, he just won't play him then, in, in my opinion. But um, he, there is an exceptionally tight leash there. 
There is an exception to tight leash, but I think that's an a, that's a guard issue. I don't think it's because he wants to see Jin gone. No, I think that you know it became a little more challenging this year for, for minutes because of Blackwell obviously produced early and and Max took a step up. So I know I don't think he wants him gone because honestly, this sounds like simplistic, but if he wanted him gone, I feel like he would have left before the year started. Like he would have just been like, all right, like you know, you, he had an opportunity to leave earlier in the in the off season. So no, I think he still wants him to be there. So I'm gonna just say you're right about the leash thing. And I think it's moronic. I think that you've seen enough other guys play poorly over this last stretch where it's just become stupid where it's like, why are you holding him to a different standard than everybody else? I realized earlier, you could say when people were playing solid defense, that he was a weakness there. We have guys, multiple guys now. And, and Klesmet, who is a guy that we really liked as a defender, who's been not great over the last how many games, you have multiple other guys who you're not holding to the same standard, and at least he gives you something on the offensive end. So I don't understand why we're making this thought, the, having the thought process that, hey, let's really stick it to him, and he can, if any mistake that he makes, we're pulling him off the court, but everyone else can just make errors at will. Like how many games have we had where we turn the ball over with just lazy passing and and stupid maneuvers by guys out on the court that were not punished at all? More than a couple. Yeah, a lot. Let me ask you this, though. Let me play devil's advocate, um, both of you. Like, who's really at fault here? Is it Gray Guard or is it more on Connor, who is shooting 31% from three, who is not really giving you anything else? So if you if you shoot 31% from three and you come in and immediately foul a three-point shooter, by the way, that call was super iffy. Fair. Yeah. But, I, I listen, there's culpability on a player. You, you need to produce when you're on the court, too. 100%. There's culpability on Connery. Absolutely. Like, especially early in the season. Now, he had that back injury, so who knows how long that hindered him. But, yeah, you, you've got to make those shots. You've got to make that impact. I will give him credit, though. He's not afraid to take those shots. He knows that, and he's coming in there with a clear mindset of, when I get the ball and if I'm open, I am going to shoot, and I appreciate that. And I think those will fall if he gets more minutes. And I think that, just kind of the, the flow of the game and how he flows even defensively, the more he's out there, it will improve. So yes, there's culpability on Connor, but guard has got to give him some time. I think we also need to look at his splits a little bit too. Like the, the reason why his three point percentage is so low is because right coming right out of that injury, he was bad for a stretch there. It was like, yeah, what would you like over 17 or something like that. It was super, but like he was really rough. He's been probably closer to 40% over the last month, month and a half here since he's been yeah. back and, and running at full. And I think that he's probably one of our better three-point shooters over that time. I do have some times when I watch him where I'm like, your, your trigger's a little quick, kind of like Ilver, when he gets out there and he's like, see ball, throw ball. And yep. it's like, all right, relax a little bit. Like, get in the flow of things. I trust it a little more with Connor because so much good happens when he does do it, but it can <laughs> almost throw off your offense. I will say this too: to some degree, you can't blame Connor for that. If he no, knows he has a quick hook, he's gotta, he's, he's gotta take his chances when he gets them. He's gonna take every shot he can get. Like I mean, because he doesn't get an opportunity for more later in the game. So to some degree, I think that's where guard has kind of set him up for failure. It's basically like go out there and shoot as quickly as you can because you're coming out in three minutes. Because invariably, something wrong is gonna happen, and I'm gonna yank you. But again, I do think there is a little culpability for Connor. A couple more really quick questions here. We're not gonna get to all these. This is from seven one five. Do I'm guessing do north. Uh, guys, basketball players that have met or exceeded your expectations this year. Blackwell. Uh, Blackwell's for sure Blackwell. Um, I would say Blackwell. I think Store has Storr. met. Store yep. Store has met my expectations. I wouldn't say exceeded this because I did expect him to to be our leading scorer and and to provide a lot of athleticism, which he's done. Um, and I would say Chucky to an extent as well this year because. Like we want, we knew he, his role had to change and it did. Obviously now he's beginning to take more shots, which I appreciate. Uh, but I think he's done a really, really good job of just kind of being the floor general, getting his, getting other players involved. And until this little slump that we had, I mean, his assist to turnover ratio has been fantastic. It yeah. still is actually. So I would say this year, he's also exceeded my expectations in that particular regard. He's interesting to me because he's, he's kind of bipolar there. Like he has both at times met and exceeded and times, you know, not met this and season <laughs> so it's like there's there's times when chucky has been incredible and there's times when it's like dude to shoot the ball or drive it to the hoop or have an idea what you're doing because there's a couple of times i've seen him drive and then just get down there and just not know what he's going to do with the ball it's like you either need to know who you're kicking that to or you got to go up with it i think for me i mean listen to me crowd and wall just met expectations this is exactly who i thought they were like they haven't exceeded it 
but this is who we've seen from Crowell for years. Nothing he's done this year surprised me at all. And Wall the same way. This is the Wall we saw for the most part prior to his injury, where it's a little inconsistent here and there, but he does a lot of hustle plays. He's probably our best post player. I think, Justin, you said that in your show the other day. I agree with that. They both – I don't know – I guess my – I don't know what people were expecting if you you think the, those didn't meet expectations, I guess. I'm not saying you, either of you said that, but I think, to me, they both met expectations. Yeah, I would also say Klesman has met – has exceeded expectations. And I know the on-off switch has been a little bit difficult this year, but, I mean, the fact that he can go off and score 20 straight points and do what he can do and obviously still play well defensively, we really thought that Connor was going to take a bigger step this year and Max wasn't maybe going to be as involved, but I think Max has definitely exceeded my expectations this season. See, Crowell for me is a tough one because I look at it from the stance of I, I need to see it on both ends of the court. And I think offensively, to some extent, you could say that he met or exceeded. Defensively, like I have more expectations of what I expect for a guy who's a seven footer to average less than a block a game and to not be able to disrupt shots at the rim like he does. His rotations aren't terrible. I, I will give him credit for that, but he does an awful job of disrupting shots. And I don't, I don't even need blocks. Just at least make the guy uncomfortable so that they're not getting layups or, you know, shooting floaters and stuff like that at will over us. Because that, that's just not who really he is, well though. Right. Isn't that who he's been for three years, yeah. though? This is, this is what yeah, I'm saying. But I, think, I, I look at it through the lens of what do you expect from an actual center in college basketball, and I just think that he doesn't make it – he doesn't meet it up there. Defensively, he's a bad, a bad center in my eyes. I, so I can res- – I definitely respect that perspective that you want a different type of center, but – I will say, like, it, I just think that, it, and, and he's lower, he's below average from a college standpoint at that position defensively. But did you expect more from him this year defensively? Because I, I think he should. I expect him to at least be average. I think he's average defensively. I really do. I, I think he plays pretty good positionally. He's just not a shot blocker, but he never has been. I guess what I'm saying is, you, if you expected him to do that this year, you were. That's not who he's going to be, right? That's probably unfair expectations for him I, in the tier that he's in. Yeah, I think I mean I, I think that we're not far off seeing the way the way we're seeing it. It's just his the the lack of some of the things that we're seeing from him is the probably the weak biggest weakness in this team right now. And I think that that I mentioned it yesterday when we talked about it from from this team's perspective of where their ceiling is, it's directly tied to him. If if he has a game against a team where a center dominates him, we're going to lose that game because we will get a net negative overall because of the fact that we're he will get dominated. We've seen him be one of four shooting for three points and and four rebounds in a game. And if we go against somebody that puts up 18, that's a big mountain to climb Mm -hmm. if somebody on the opposite side is dominant. Which is why you got to go get a five this offseason. Exactly. You need help there. Um, Guys, last question here. We went a little long. We didn't get to every question. But last one here, uh, record prediction down the stretch. Five games left. Uh, Three and two. I think we will lose both our road games and win all our home games. Yeah, I'm at three and two as well. One and four. Justin's zero oh and five. So <laughs> negative. We're we're losing. To, we're going to lose to Purdue. We're going to lose to Purdue. to uh, Illinois. We're going to lose to Indiana, and I think that we will split with Rutgers and in Maryland. You think we're going to uh, drop one of those games at home, Maryland or Rutgers? Yes, I do. I, I, I don't trust this team. They they haven't given me a reason to trust them lately. Uh, they, they've given me a reason to trust them at the Cole Center. We've lost one game, and it's to Purdue. I mean, I, I don't – I think we'll get it done at the Cole Center. I, I really do. And Maryland and Rutgers are not good enough. Now, Illinois is good enough to beat us at the Cole Center. That I will that I will give you that. I don't think it's going to happen, but they're good enough to do it. Maryland and Rutgers, though, I, I just feel like they're when, – when we went into Rutgers, like that's a tough game for us because it's a road game. But that's – think about them. Like they're they're not coming into the Cole Center and getting I, them. I just can't see that. We've talked about the things that I said that the reason why they're a problem for us. They're more athletic than us. They have good size, and they will sit there and, and play a game of attrition with us. And if we're not going to – if we're not sticking it offensively, we'll lose that game because they're just going to grind us out. They're what we Wisconsin shoot, used to be. We, we are not better at home. We shoot better at home. We're going to shoot. They're one of the top games. defenses in the country. I'm not going to just assume that they're not going to be their defense won't travel. I don't think that they need to feed off of it because they're not an offensive team. Now you can say that their shooting won't be as good this time, but I I am hesitant to say that our offense is going to be great against a team that plays that good defensively. Yeah, I I mean, listen, those are all fair perspectives and points. I just think I again, I I think at times we look too much at this last chunk of games and we judge the team based on that. I, I think we're better than that. I, I also don't think we're as good as the sixth ranked team in the country where we mm-hmm. got, I think the truth is in the middle and these other teams aren't very good either. 
right? Like we outside of Purdue and Illinois, we don't have a murderer stretch. So. I don't know if they're lacking confidence as much as we are, though, either. That's part That's of fair. it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say three and two. Um, no matter what, anywhere between five and zero oh and zero oh and five, we will be here after every show, <laughs> for better or worse. Um, guys, uh, Justin Rajiv over on the Buck Report, I saw they did a really good breakdown of uh, football uh, depth charts, even though some things I disagreed with, but really good job on that the other day. Go check out their work for sure. You guys got any last thoughts on on really anything we talked about today, or any other big picture things going on in your brain, football, basketball, Badgers. I, I promise I'm not this negative. <laughs> I'm just very uh, much a, what are you talking very about? much a realist. <laughs> I would say, look, we're we're a month away from spring ball. Hopefully we get an announcement soon and we can talk about the spring football game and when that's going to be. Uh, but I'm I'm excited to, to see what the especially the new guys that are coming in. I can't wait to see what what news comes out of spring practice. It's only a month away. Uh, hallelujah there i'm I'm right spring spring hopes eternal right spring births eternal hope well, i don't know what i'm trying to say no, there, you had it you had it correct the first time so i'm excited about that i'm still excited about the rest of the basketball season i'm excited to see what we can potentially turn around here and get into march march is always the best time of the year um on wisconsin guys thank you so much for joining us we'll talk later